Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Bradley, and I'm a research associate here at Mississippi State University's and the Social Science Research Center. I also work on the Child Health and Development Project, also known as Mississippi Thrive. This project is a collaborative uh, grant between the Social Science Research Center here at Mississippi State University, as well as the University of Mississippi Medical Center's Children's of Mississippi. The grant is funded by the Health Resources Services Administration, also known as HRSA. And we're excited to talk to you today about early childhood development and tools that you can use to turn everyday moments into brain building moments and resources to support you along the way. So on the next slide, we'll learn a little bit more. So each day in Mississippi, about 100 new babies are born across the state. These new lives are full of tremendous potential. We are working to improve the developmental and behavioral health of children in Mississippi from birth to age five. And we're doing this by working with parents, early childhood professionals, as well as healthcare providers to enhance attention to developmental milestones and strengthen children's brain architecture. And then for our learning objectives today, we want you to know that we can act early to reduce the number of preventable delays in our children in Mississippi. Also, you can support children's brain architecture and early development. And then also it's important to act early and help build healthy brains in the first years of life. For Mississippi to reach its full potential, our state's children must reach theirs. And we hope by the end of this session that you'll be able to recognize your role in children's healthy development and the opportunities you have to build their brains, as well as being familiar with the term developmental milestones and the tools that you can use to mark these milestones like using checklists. And then lastly, we hope that you'll be able to plan your next steps. Be aware of any resources that support children's development and brain architecture like Vroom, and you can be knowledgeable on where to find these resources and how to share this information with others in your community. So in part one, we're gonna learn about the science of early brain development and the impact of early childhood experiences on outcomes across the lifespan. We'll also learn how we can increase the brain building opportunities for children in our lives. So two key takeaways in part one, um, the first being that the foundation of the brain is being built in the early years. And the more brain building opportunities like talking, reading, and singing with adults that children have in the early years, the stronger their brain connections will be. And then also the next takeaway is that we hope that you know to build a young child's brain, the main thing that adults need is a positive relationship with that child. And Caregivers and, and childhood professionals have agreed for some time that early childhood development includes the physical, um, the social, emotional, and the cognitive and language domains of development from birth through age eight. And many of us have recognized the importance of these early years. But we know from further research that the earliest stages of life matter so much more than we once believed and that these earliest years and stages have everything to do with a person's later ability to thrive. The things that children experience and the skills they develop in the early years affect their development down the line. And this lays a foundation for future learning, abilities, behavior, and health. And on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about why this is important. So babies and toddlers are undergoing an especially intense period of brain development with 1 million neural connections being made each second. This time is the basis for lifelong learning and the experiences and environments around young children shape this development, laying either a sturdy or fragile foundation. Key construction tasks during this stage are social and emotional, meaning that children are learning to form relationships, develop a sense of autonomy, and regulate their emotions. When children are well supported, their brains get wired for healthy development and relationships with others, and an overall feeling of well-being. 
if there are any developmental concerns, it is easier and typically more effective to address them early and to strengthen that early foundation, foundation as much as possible. So how does a brain grow? Brain development begins before birth and continues until the early 20s. The architecture of the brain is being built from the bottom up, from back to front, with intense construction going on from infancy through age five. The parts of the brain and the back grow first and help our body to do basic functions like breathing, controlling our heart rhythm, seeing and hearing. The front part of the brain is the last part to fully develop, and it's responsive, responsible for the executive function part of our brain. Executive function is also kind of known as the air traffic control section of our brain, and these skills are still developing during the adolescent and adult early years. They develop more completely when a strong foundation for development is built in the early years, and because it is the last part to develop, it's one reason why young children need lots of help with skills like following steps with multiple directions, waiting, taking turns, staying focused, using self-control, and even planning ahead. So now let's picture a house that's being built that has many rooms. And just like a house with many rooms, the brain has different areas. And each of these areas develops at a different time and has a different function. The experiences a child has determines how the brain cells grow and connect together like a house that is getting wired up. Brain circuits that get used a lot become strengthened. So it's up to all of us, you know, parents, teachers, and even grandparents and family members to encourage activities like playing peekaboo, reading and playing together that foster healthy brain development. Caring adults can also help buffer any of these stressful life experiences that children face and prevent these stresses from becoming toxic and having a long-term long impact on the developing brain. So when exposure to stressful situations like physical or emotional abuse is prolonged and occurs without adequate adult support, it, it can become toxic. Toxic stress can occur when a child experiences strong, frequent, and prolonged adversity, such as exposure to violence and or the accumulated burdens of family economic hardship, especially during times like COVID like these, all without adequate support. And this kind of prolonged activation of the, of the stress response system can disrupt the, the development of the brain and other organ systems, and it can increase the reach for stress and all these kind of related disease and cognitive impairment well into the adult years. So how can we kind of combat toxic stress? One of the concepts we're gonna talk about is called serve and return. Serve and return interactions help shape brain architecture. Much like a game of tennis, volleyball, or even ping pong, this back and forth is both fun and capacity building. When caregivers are sensitive and responsive to a young child's signals and their needs, they provide an environment that is rich in serving return experiences. And when an infant um, or a child babbles or they cry and an adult responds to those cries and babbles with eye contact, with words, or even a hug, um, neural connections are being built and strengthened in the child's brain. And because these responsive relationships are both expected and essential, their absence is a serious threat to a child's development and well being. The absence of serve and return interaction kind of acts as a double whammy, which means that the brain doesn't get the positive stimulation that it needs, and the body's stress response is activated, which floods the brain with harmful stress hormones. So up next, we're gonna watch a video and learn a little bit more about brain architecture. This video is made by the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative, and it shows the important relationships between brain development 
and early childhood experiences. Let's take a look. Modern science now tells us a great deal about how brains are built in childhood. Did you know that early childhood experiences actually change our brains in ways that affect our health throughout our lives? We have a, a, a very kind of rich and um, rapidly growing science about um, early childhood development and particularly how early experiences affect long-term outcomes um, in learning as well as physical and mental health. And we also have a huge amount of, of new research that is helping us understand how adversity early in life and particularly the toxic stress that young children can experience gets into the body um, and actually affects the developing architecture of the brain. So experiences we have in our earliest years affect how our brains get built. That's important because the basic structures we develop as infants lay the foundation for more complex structures that develop as we grow. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain to provide a sturdy base for a lifetime of better health. On the other hand, if a child experiences a pileup of negative experiences, such as abuse or neglect, and if no caregiver is there to provide support, a sturdy brain foundation may never develop. That can lead to lifelong learning difficulties and health problems, including addiction and mental illness. It affects the cardiovascular system, it affects the immune system. And so um, what this science is telling us is that we ignore the early years at our peril. It's amazing to think that the experiences we have in our earliest years can affect our health for a lifetime. Since strong societies are made up of healthy individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all kids have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need to build healthy brains and bodies. So now let's look a little bit closer at developmental progress. <clears throat> so first we'll ask, what are developmental milestones? These are the skills that children typically learn and develop at certain ages, such as starting to walk or smile and even waving goodbye. Children reach milestones in how they play, learn, speak, act, and even move, such as crawling or walking. Developmental milestones offer clues about a child's developmental health. And it's also to, um, important to remember that it's fun to celebrate these milestones with children as they learn to do uh, new things. And it's also important to mark these developmental milestones that usually happen at these certain ages. Pay attention to any progress that the child makes towards these milestones, and also notice when they do not reach the milestones at the expected time. If there is a delay, it is usually easier and more effective to take action early rather than waiting. Often there are available supports that can boost the child's progress. Now, some milestones are extremely important and not reaching those milestones by a certain age can equal a red flag. Each developmental stage has its own red flags. For example, a child who at seven months still flops his head back when being pulled to a sitting position would be a red flag that we would want the child's pediatrician to further explore. Now, some children might reach those milestones a little bit later than their peers and may need a little bit of extra support. But always keep in mind that progress is not always steady for all children, and that children develop at their own pace. Typically, we've said that a baby takes their first steps around 12 months. However, I'm sure you know some children who began to walk at nine months and some who may have waited a little bit later, such as 15 months. 
So a child not being able to walk at 12 months is not a red flag. However, if at 18 months that child is not walking, we might not have a red flag that we want to further explore with our child's health care provider. So we're going to talk a little bit about developmental monitoring and screening. Um, developmental milestones, it's important to understand the difference between these two terms. So developmental monitoring means that we observe and note specific ways that a child plays, learns, speaks, acts, and even moves every day in an ongoing way. Developmental monitoring often involves checking in with a child's developmental progress using a checklist of developmental milestones, like we saw on the last slide. And it's something that providers can use and, sh and even early childhood professionals can use to share with families so they can mark the child's milestones together. Um, if you do work with families, be sure to review these milestones at um, recommended intervals and compare what different people in the community sees with the child each day. You can download free milestone checklists from the website at the cdc.gov. Remember that developmental monitoring is flexible, continuous, and it's quick. Monitoring allows us to celebrate a child's development as well as talk about their progress. It acts as kind of a guide for professionals and even other parents like I said, to mention to someone about how a child is progressing. Also, monitoring allows us to learn what to expect next, and it helps us identify any concerns early. It's important to recognize early warning signs that may indicate developmental delays or disabilities. To be able to identify children with disabilities and special needs, it is important to have a general understanding of typical development in early childhood. And also monitoring allows us to help make choices and set up age appropriate daily routines, expectations, and even lesson planning. So developmental screening is a more formal process and it uses a validated screening tool and is a structured set of questions that are related to specific ages to determine if a child's development is on track or whether they need to be referred for further evaluation. Developmental screening is recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics at nine, 18, and 24 or 30 month intervals. And also autism specific screenings are recommended at 18 and 20 months, 24 months, excuse me. Encourage family members and people in your community to ask their child's healthcare provider for developmental screening at these recommended stages for any time there is concern about their development. According to one of our recent studies, only 30% of young children in Mississippi have had their overall development checked by their healthcare professional. Both developmental screening and monitoring should be done for all children. And now Heather Martin, which is our Mississippi Statewide Broom Coordinator, is gonna to talk to us about some ways that we can turn everyday moments into brain building moments and that support our child's development. Thank you so much, Bradley. We're gonna take just a few moments to learn more about some of the tools that we can use to better understand how our children are growing and how we can support their early development. So in the next slide, you can see learning starts with a relationship between a parent or caregiver and a child. Every time we connect with young children, it isn't just their eyes that light up, it's their brains too. Vroom helps all parents discover that they already have what it takes to boost their child's learning. Science is at the very heart of Vroom and every aspect is informed by the nation's leading neuroscientists, psychologists, and researchers in early child development, as well as everyday parents. So every one of us has been affected in a positive way by an adult caregiver. In this next slide, um, you can see a quote from James Comer, and it says, no 
significant learning can occur without a significant relationship. So James Comer is one of the nation's leading educational pioneers and innovators from the Yale Child Study Center. His child development program has been being used by schools for over 40 years, but that quote has meant um, huge things in my life as I began teaching 16 years ago. When I think back to that and I think about those significant relationships in my life, my mom, Francis, comes to mind. And I think about the times that we worked in the garden together, that we played games, that we worked in the kitchen and she taught me different things. And I think the thing that made the biggest difference was that when I was with her, she made me feel like I was the most important thing in the world to her at that moment. Um, my oldest child was named Francis after her. But I want you to think about that statement one more time. No significant learning can occur without a significant relationship. You're going to hear more as we go today about how much that relationship is actually a factor in the science behind Verum as well. And because of that, you can see in the next slide, everybody has what it takes. Everyone has what it takes to be a brain builder. So, now let's look at these five brain building basics. From the moment, moment a baby is born, there are simple things that you can do to help build a child's brain. Um, look, you can tell what a child is interested in before they can use words and before they can talk just by where their gaze is, just by what they're looking at. Um, by following these clues and making eye contact, it shows them that you're interested too. Then we have take turns. Children learn from taking turns. When you're playing, talking, exploring, they go and then you go and then you just keep repeating, just like the serve and return that Bradley talked about. And then we have chat. Children's brains light up when you talk, when you sing, when you read, when you make sounds even back and forth. You can have a back and forth conversation with an infant before they can use words just by making those sounds back and forth and seeing if they'll mimic you. And those pretend conversations truly do build the language skills that they're going to need later on. And then their stretch. Children's brains grow strong when you stretch out those experiences, when you stretch out those conversations. Um, it's the difference in, instead of asking what's your favorite color, asking why is that your favorite color? Why do you like this color more than that color? Taking those moments further, extending the moments more. And then there's follow. Children learn best when we follow their lead. And so listening to them and listening to their ideas and their sounds when their baby's watching their movements and just following what they're doing. Those are the five brain building basics. And so that is the foundation for which Vroom is built upon. In the next slide, we're going to see um, how we take those brain building basics and make up what is known as a Vroom tip. So if the brain building basics are the foundation on which Vroom is built, then these tips are the bricks. Um, and there are over 1,000 Vroom tips that promote skills like language development, early literacy, early numeracy, social emotional growth, and even executive function skills. Each tip is written to be developmentally appropriate, but Vroom understands that every child develops differently and every child develops at their own pace. So each tip comes with a suggested age range to help parents find the right fit for their child. But Vroom is not a diagnostic tool. But most importantly, these tips are meant to be fun. You know, children learn best when they don't even know they're learning, when they think they're just having fun. And, and we as adults are going to be more likely to participate if we're having fun too. So let's look at this room tip here. It's kind of the anatomy of a room tip. And on the left side, we can see um, that this room tip is suggested to be for ages four and five. We see the title of this tip is Home Museum. And we see that the tip says, invite your child to find some special things and put them out like they're in a museum or a store and have them lead you through that collection and share why those things are meaningful and take turns and share your favorite things with each other. 
every tip is going to have the activity there what you're going to do and it tells you as an adult or a parent what to do with the child but every tip also has the brainy background and the brainy brainy background <laughs> sorry is the why why are we doing this tip why is this important this is the science behind each broom tip so it reminds you why you're doing the activity and it goes along and helps us see how it helps with with child development. So in this one, it tells us that not only are they thinking about what to say and how they're gonna say it, children are using their memory too. And when we listen and share with them, we're building a safe place for learning. So as we move on, we can see, you know, we've talked about the basics and we've talked about these tips. How do I access this? How do I find these tips? Well, this is probably the way that's shared the most, and this is the Vroom app. Um, but there are several ways you can access Vroom tips. The free and fun app here, you can download using um, Apple or Android, and it's available also through any web browser just by going to the website. The website is vroom.org, and we're gonna look at that later. But what's great about the app is that you can use the Discover feature. So every day, a different Vroom tip is gonna pop up. Um, and you can use that Vroom tip. But if that Vroom tip doesn't fit into what you're doing that day, you can use a Discover feature to find another one. Or if maybe you want to work specifically on um, numbers with your child, you can use Discover feature to, to focus on that. And so it really helps you with whatever you're doing at that moment, whether it be chore time, meal time, bath time, bedtime, or even during those times when you're waiting. Um, it's wonderful because it just layers on to what you're already doing. It's not something you have to set aside special time for, and it's not something that that you have to have money to do or anything like that. It just fits into the daily life of a family. So you can find tips that focus on specific skills like early literacy, language, and you can save those favorites as well. So when you find that tip that you just enjoy doing so much, you can save it as a favorite. And then that next time you're waiting for the doctor's appointment or you're waiting in line at Walmart, you can pull up that tip right then and do it together. But this is just one of the ways that you can access Vroom. So in the next slide, we're gonna see a few other ways. So in addition to the app that you see here first, um, we also can see that Vroom tips are available by text message. And so, in the middle, you can see that you can text Vroom to 48258. And as you do that, um, they're gonna ask a few questions just to get you set up. And then you can also see how when the Vroom tips are sent by text, you have to um, text a word to extend the text to get them all. The amazing things about these are that um, they're sent weekly and they're sent to your phone and they don't include any videos, links, or images. So they can be accessed even if you don't have a data plan or an internet connection. Now the last image you see here is Alexa. And so you can even add Vroom as an Alexa skill and be able to ask Alexa for your Vroom tip each day. Now notice as well that message and data rates do apply, but the Vroom app is absolutely free. Vroom will always be free. So, also the website that I mentioned earlier, make sure anytime you're checking out the website that you use vroom.org instead of vroom.com. Um, vroom.org is the, the website that you will visit and the Vroom tips are free and available across all the Vroom platforms in English and Spanish. But on the website, there are print at home collections that you can print out that are also available in 16 additional languages as well. So you can share Vroom with families by printing out um, those tip collections. You can share flyers that talk about how to access the text and how to access the app and the websites as well under the My Pro Professionals tab on the website. As well, you can see in the next slide that Vroom is on YouTube. And the awesome thing about these videos is that you can actually see real families doing these tips together. And so you can go there and see what that looks like. And of course, 
Vroom is available on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube by typing in Vroom or join Vroom and looking for the orange logo. This is just my contact information here in the website one more time. Don't ever hesitate to contact me if I can help you as a family or as an organization um, in sharing Vroom across our state. So parents and those who give daily care to young children can really impact healthy development. Um, you can see on the next slide that by building positive relationships and supportive environments for children, your impact matters. Research shows that children with even just one consistent positive adult relationship do better than children with none, and it is never too late. So be aware that the experiences we provide are building brain architecture. So how will your relationships with children affect their brain development? Um, providing positive relationships and supportive enriching environments and fostering those positive parent-child relationships as best you can as a parent or caregiver. And if you work with families, you can even model those interactions for parents and share information with them. Talk to them about early child development um, as early as possible. Remind parents, and if you are a parent, remember that you are your child's favorite toy. They want to spend time with you and interact with you. Set realistic expectations based on brain development. By, by understanding those developmental milestones, we know how to support and how to cope with them when, the, when they're going through challenging moments. So talk with families about these as well. And so next, to our love, a research associate at Mississippi State University Social Science Research Center is gonna talk to you more about resources that you can use and that you can share. Thank you, Heather. Um, hello, everyone. My name is T.R. Love, and as mentioned, I'm a research associate at the MSU Social Science Research Center. <clears throat> I'm excited to talk to you all about our Mississippi Thrive website and other resources that are available to you. We have covered a lot in this presentation, but now we're going to review where to go from here and what we can use as, our, as we take our next steps. <clears throat> so here on this slide, we could talk about um, some of the resources that offer developmental services and support in Mississippi. Early intervention, also known as first step, provides services for children under the age of three. And the referral process can be done either by phone or through a form with the Mississippi State Department of Health. And then we have Child Find, and they provide services for children who are three and older. And that referral process is done by calling your local school district. <clears throat> so on the next slide, we're gonna, we've mentioned a lot of these in the presentation, but I want to highlight a few for you all. Talking is Teaching, the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative, the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University, UNICEF Parenting, and Zero to Three have more information for caregivers and families about brain building and healthy development. Mississippi Early Childhood Inclusion Center, which is also known as MECIC, is an important statewide resource and this program is designed specifically to support child care center directors and teachers who have questions or concerns about a child's development. They will talk with families about early childhood development, provide free developmental screenings when there are concerns, and link families with other supports. Help Me Grow also provides developmental screenings in addition to linking family with families with resources. They also have a hotline that you can call to find out about developmental source resources in your area. <clears throat> and now we're going to take a look at our website, Mississippi Drive. Um, I'd like to show you a quick overview of our website where we have other resources available. So if you go to www.mississippidrive.com, you will see that we have our site section for parents and families, teachers, and healthcare professionals. We also have a page with materials available in Spanish. Recently, we just hosted our first Mississippi Forum for the Future along with the Mississippi Children's Foundation and the Mississippi Early, Early Learning Alliance. The focus was on all the current work being done to promote early childhood health and development, and we hope to have more events like this coming up later in the year. We would love for anyone, parents or professionals, who are interested to subscribe to our monthly newsletter on the Mississippi Drive website to stay in the know of everything we have going on and more resources that we come upon. 
<clears throat> so now we're going to break down each section of the website. On the next slide, this portion is for parents and families. So this content, we have uh, a children's book that our own Heather Martin wrote called One Day at a Time. And this book was, um, is about a little girl and her mom and their experiences while in quarantine. The story includes embedded room tips and is a free download that you can read online or print to share with others. To the far right is a screenshot image of the bottom of our webpage where we have a ton more resources specific to parents, such as how to talk to your doctor when it comes to your child's development. And the next section of the website is for teachers. And um, here we have some information about how young children's brains develop. And the resources here include links to download free developmental milestone checklists from ages two months to five years, information on how you can build children's brains, and the importance of talking, reading, and singing with children. We also have tools to engage with families. There are also tips about how to talk to families about children's developmental progress, including any concerns you may have. We have links to the Mississippi Families for Kids website and Help Me Girls website. I also wanted to note that on this page, we have listed some training opportunities and links to professional development for child care providers. <clears throat> and the last section of our website is for health care providers. And we have various resources like the one pictured here that discusses screening versus surveillance. It's similar to what Bradley talked about earlier, development of monitoring versus development of screening but it's more specific to the healthcare provider. This page also has links to free printable materials like those from the CDC, Mind the Science Act Early Campaign, and we also have information about professional development opportunities like Project ECHO that is shown here. Lastly, I'd like to show you the resources section of our website. Here we have resources that have been mentioned throughout this presentation and many, many more. All the resources are listed where you can directly link and or download to print or share. We also have a resource map. These are interactive maps that are broken up into different categories that are sorted by county. You can zoom out to find your area, click on the specialty you'd like to search for, and then click on each location to find the address and specialties offered. If you're looking at this on, on mobile device, you can click the address to get the directions along with a direct link to the phone numbers. Under each map, we have a place to leave us a comment if you know of any more resources that need to be changed or updated. In our licensed child care centers and families resource map, excuse me, <laughs> we have everything from children's museums to early intervention services. <clears throat> we, hope, we hope you will take some time to explore our website and please contact us with any questions or comments you may have at MississippiThrive at gmail.com or you can call us at the number listed on the slide. We'd love for you to follow us on our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you again for your time today, and we're optimistic that you join us in our continued work and effort to help the children of Mississippi thrive. And we want to thank you, Leslie and Brittany, and the Mississippi Parent Training and Information Center for allowing us to speak on this platform today. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can, uh, there's a question box that drops down on the right hand side of your screen on the control panel. You can type them in there. But if you don't have any questions right now, um, we'll make sure that everyone gets contact information for everyone. So if you want to, if you think of something later after you visited the website or, or have time to digest the information, you can always reach out to them and uh, get your questions answered or find the resources you're looking for. But I don't see any questions and thank you all so much. It's always important to make sure that parents know about all the resources that are available and how to access them. And uh, hopefully we can have y'all back again at another time as, as guests. Uh, everybody wasn't here today and we know there are other people who still don't know about you yet. But um, again, thank you for thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to Bradley and Heather and Tiara for um, presenting and, and joining us today. And everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.